Okay, so I'm going to go carefully over all of the practice exam problems because these are long and complicated problems and I think it will be very helpful to everyone if we've got some practice doing these kinds of long calculations. The problems in this practice exam should be quite close to the problems that are on the actual exam as well, so going over them should help with the exam. I'm aware that when I have two screens up like this or two, two pictures up like this at once, it tends to make the make it hard to read a little bit after the resolution gets reduced on YouTube on uh, both sides. But for working problems like this, having some space to work with is really necessary. So I'm going to try and go with this double view approach uh, despite the problems with the resolution. All right. Problem number one here is one of the standard kinds of problems. It's very likely to be on the, on the exam. Likely enough to be on the final exam, too, for that matter. <clears throat> and it's a discrete state Boltzmann distribution problem. So in this case, if I shrink one side and grow the other one a little bit, we have a system with just four states labeled 0, 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to calculate everything, pretty much everything we can, everything thermodynamic and statistical, on just these four states. And the reason this problem is so standard is because it's just about the simplest kind of Boltzmann problem there is. And so if you can do this kind of problem, then you're in pretty good shape. If you can't do this kind of problem, then you've got to do some more work. All right, so in this case, we're, there's two energy levels, E0 and E1. We're setting E0 equal to 0. We're setting E1 equal to this quantity epsilon, which means that the gap between the two, the two levels is epsilon. And <clears throat> um, that means that we have degeneracy in the book's notation, that's, degen that's G0 equal to 2 and degeneracy equal to 2 at the second level. Also, in my notation, that's W0 equals 2 or W1 is equal to 2. Sorry, this shouldn't be G0 up here. It should be G1. Okay, so that's our setup and our situation. The first question that gets asked is about the partition function. That's always going to be the first question because you need the partition function in order to do everything else. So the partition function, remember, is just the sum over all states of Boltzmann factors or the sum over all levels of degeneracies times Boltzmann factors. Since we have degeneracies in this case, let's use the level approach. So Q in that case is equal to the degeneracy for the ground state, that's 2, times e to the minus beta energy for the ground state, plus the degeneracy for the first level, times e to the minus beta e for the first level. And that's a 0, and that's an epsilon, and so that becomes 2 times well, let me not be so quick, 2 times 1, that's a 1, plus 2 times e to the minus beta epsilon, and that's 2 times 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon. So that's our general expression for Q. And then it asks us to take limits when t is equal to 0, when t is equal to epsilon over k, and when t is equal to infinity, for t equals 0, beta goes to infinity, so this becomes e to the minus infinity, which is 0. That means that's 0. That means q is just equal to 2. That means that everything is frozen into the ground, the two ground states, and there's no population in the upper states. We'll see that in the next section when we actually calculate probabilities. Um, let me erase some of this stuff now. At t goes to infinity, that means beta is going to 0. <clears throat> that means 
this Boltzmann factor becomes a 1, that means this whole quantity is a 2, and that means Q is equal to 4, which just means all four states are equally populated. That's, of course, both of these things are what you'd expect, right? When you have zero kinetic energy, zero, sorry, zero thermal energy around, then you can't promote anything to the upper states. Everything's got to be in the ground state. On the other hand, when you've got an infinite amount of thermal energy around, then the energy gap doesn't matter, and everything has equal probability. In between, when T is equal to epsilon over K like this, that means beta, which is 1 over KT, is equal to just 1 over epsilon. That means E to the minus beta epsilon is just equal to E to the minus 1. So this choice for T basically means that all the Boltzmann factors are E to the minus 1s. If I put that in, let me erase some of that stuff, to our formula for Q up here, that means Q is just equal to 2 times 1 plus e to the minus 1. And going over here, you can see I've computed that number already. It's 2.736. which means that <clears throat> we're getting some population of both levels now. Not everything's frozen. We've got a population greater than two, so we've got some population above the ground state, the two ground state levels. But it's not, it's less than four, which means we're not completely populating the ground state levels. So we've got some intermediate situation, which is exactly what you'd expect. All right, that's the first part. The next part asks for the probabilities. And, oh gosh. And so we're calculating now not Q, but probabilities. Here they are over on this side. And probability, Boltzmann probability, P sub i is always a Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta e sub i divided by Q. We have Q now. So we've just got to fill in these Boltzmann factors for each of the four levels. But the four, each of the four states, sorry, but the four states come in two levels. Here's, we should get P0, P1, P2, P3. These two probabilities have to be equal, right? Because they have equal energy. And likewise, these upper two probabilities also have to be equal because they also have equal energy. So we have P0 is equal to P1 is equal to the Boltzmann factor for the ground state. That's e to the minus beta energy for the ground state, but that energy is 0 in this case. So we're getting e to the 0, which is just 1. So that means just 1 over Q. And likewise for P2, which is equal to P3, we're going to get e to the minus beta, the energy for the upper state, which is just epsilon divided by Q. So those are our four probabilities easily gotten enough. And now we have to evaluate those at T equals zero, T equals epsilon over K, and T goes to infinity. When the temperature is equal to zero, beta goes to infinity. We know that Q then goes to just two, and so P zero is going to equal P1 is just going to be equal to 1 half. And P2 is going to equal P3 is going to equal 0, right? Because when beta goes to infinity, that Boltzmann factor on top goes to 0. And that also makes sense because it just means that everything's frozen into the ground state, exactly as I said a minute ago when we were talking about Q up above. Probabilities are both a half for the ground state uh, states because there's two of them in this case. Normally, if you've got a non-degenerate ground state, the probability would be one down there, but we've got two of them, and those two probabilities are equal even when there's uh, no temperature, when T is equal to zero, and they both have to add up to one, so they both have to be a half. All right. Then when t goes to infinity, down here in this last case, 
beta goes to zero, that means Q goes to four. And so we're going to get P0 equals P1 equals one quarter, according to our formula up here. And for P2 and P3, uh, we're also going to get one quarter. And you can see that because if beta is going to zero, then this Boltzmann factor up here goes to one. And and Q is equal to 4 again, so we're going to get 1 quarter and 1 quarter again. All right, those are the probabilities at the two extremes. In the middle case, the Boltzmann, dis the Boltzmann factor is again e to the minus 1, so and Q is now equal to uh, Q, let's see, Q is equal to 2 times... 1 plus e to the minus 1 when t is equal to epsilon over k. And so p0 is equal to p1, which is just 1 over q, 1 over 2 times 1 plus e to the minus 1. And I'm out of space here. Let me move stuff. P2 is going to equal P3, which is now going to be e to the minus 1 over 2 times 1 plus e to the minus 1. And now it's just a matter of plugging numbers into those e to the minus 1s. And if you do that, you'll get what I already calculated over here. So let me not recalculate it. For P0 and P1, we get about 36%. And for P2 and P3, we get about 13%. So over here, 0 0.3655, 5, 5, and 0 0.1345. Question is, if we add up all these probabilities, do we get 1? It's always a good thing to test that. There's two of these, right? So we add, add, got to add two of those. And there's two of those also. So we got to add two of those. So it's going to be 2 times this guy plus 2 times that guy. So 2 times 0.3655 plus 2 times 0.1345, that does, in fact, add up to 1. All right, so that's part B. Part C now starts asking, part C, D, and E are all asking about thermodynamic properties for this very simple system. Uh, so the first thing that's, that it, the problem asks for is the average energy or the mean energy, which is the same thing as the thermodynamic internal energy. And remember that the general formula for that is that the average energy is equal to the sum over all the states or all the states in the system of the energy for each state. Let me write it in the normal notation. That's not quite normal. The energy for each state, e to the minus beta energy for each state, that's the Boltzmann factor, divided by the Q for the whole problem. And that's summing over individual states, but if you're summing over energy levels, then it becomes the degeneracy for each level times the energy for each level times the Boltzmann factor for that level, all divided by Q. Since we have degeneracy, let's use this lowercase formula. It's going to make things a little quicker and simpler. So then in that case, E is equal to, there's only two, ter two levels, right? So only two terms in this sum. It's going to be the degeneracy for the first level, which is 2, times the energy for the first level, which is 0, times E to the minus beta energy for the first level, which is also 0 divided by Q, and that's just, uh, so that first term, ah, oh, sorry, let me redo that. So that's the first term in the sum, this one is, plus degeneracy for the next level up, which is also a 2, times the energy for the next level up, which is epsilon, times the Boltzmann factor, which is e to the minus beta epsilon for that second level, all of that over Q. This first term is a zero, right, because of the zero in energy there. And so this just becomes 2 times epsilon times e to the minus beta epsilon 
over Q, and that's our expression for the average energy. Let's rewrite it just slightly to make it a little easier to work with. So that's 2 times epsilon times e to the minus beta epsilon over, now I'm going to put Q in there, 2 times 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon. And these 2's cancel out, so our final boiled down expression is epsilon times e to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon. And that's our formula now for the average energy or equivalently the thermodynamic energy. We want to again evaluate the, that energy at T equals 0, T equals epsilon over K, and T goes to infinity. At zero, this, uh, this, so let me, hmm, let me sort of have a working copy for that formula so I can mark on it without destroying the original. And so copy that, paste it here. There's the thing I'm going to mark all over. So here's the, so at t equals zero, this guy goes to zero, right, because beta goes to infinity, and that means the average energy is going to be zero. Why is that? Well, because all the population is frozen into the ground state, and the energy of the ground state is equal to zero. Now, let's suppose that we hadn't chosen the ground state energy to be zero. Let's suppose we chose it to be some arbitrary value, which we could very well do. In that case, this, uh, this average energy would turn out to be just the energy of the ground state. In the, in the present problem, well, the, with the present choices we've made, that's zero, but it doesn't have to be. All right, at t goes to infinity, the other extreme, uh, beta goes to zero, so we have an e to the zero here, which is just a one. And that's true down here, too, so we're just going to get epsilon over 2. So in that case, the average energy is just the half of the gap size, which also makes sense because in that case, we have equal population in all four states, and the average of all those equally populated states ought to be right halfway between them, which is, in fact, where we're getting our average. And then finally, in the third case, middle case, which is always slightly more complicated than the others, we know that the Boltzmann factor for this temperature becomes e to the minus 1, and that's true down here as well, and so we're going to get that the average energy is equal to epsilon times e to the minus 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 1. And that number turns out to be, when we plug everything in, we can see it over here on the left-hand side. Where is it? It's here. It's going to be 0 0.2689, which is about 0.27 times epsilon. In other words, about 27% of the way between, so let me write this down here, between the two levels, so our average energy is about here, and that's consistent with a heavier population in the ground state and a smaller population in the upper states. Our average ought to be, when we've got a heavier population down here, our average ought to be closer to where the heavier populations are. All right, so those are the energies for this particular system, simple system. The next thing the problem asks for is the heat capacities, and the heat capacity is just the temperature derivative of the internal energy, and if it's a CV, then it's at constant volume and mole numbers. There is no volume or mole numbers in this problem, so the V and N don't really matter, but in general, we have to remember that we are holding volume constant and mole numbers constant, because in other problems, there might be a volume and a mole numbers, then it becomes important. So we can take the, the, and the, the, the thermodynamic energy here is just the average energy, so we're really taking the, the temperature derivative of E, 
And from above, E is just equal to epsilon times E to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus E to the minus beta epsilon. So we've got to take the temperature derivative of that. And it turns out to be easier to take the derivative with respect to beta. We'd like to, to take this derivative rather than the temperature derivative. Can we do that? And the answer is yes. Here's why. Here's how. Cv really is the derivative with respect to temperature. But that's equal to the derivative of beta with respect to temperature times the derivative of energy with respect to beta. So now we've got a little simpler derivative to do over here, but we've got to do that. The derivative of beta with respect to temperature is just the derivative with respect to temperature of 1 over kT, which is minus 1 over kT squared. So we then have that Cv is equal to minus 1 over kT squared times the derivative of E with respect to beta, and now that beta derivative is a little easier to take. So let's do that now. The derivative of E with respect to beta is equal to the derivative with respect to beta of epsilon times E to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus E to the minus beta epsilon. And now we've got some algebra to do. We can factor out that epsilon. So normally I skip this algebra, but I guess in this case I think we should go through it. I don't know that it's very illuminating, but it is, if we're going to actually do problems and see how they're done, then going through the algebra is part of that. So let's do it. So I'm going to factor out this constant, first of all. That's epsilon, temperature or derivative with respect to beta of e to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon. And now I'm going to do a trick just to simplify the algebra. I'm going to notice that e to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon is the same thing. I'm going to multiply top and bottom by e to the plus beta epsilon. And that doesn't change anything, right, because I'm multiplying by 1. But if I do that, then this top becomes just a 1, right? These two guys cancel each other. And in the bottom, I get e to the plus beta epsilon plus 1. Your book actually uses that trick several times. I, for the most part, haven't used that trick throughout the notes because I think it's hmm, not always very useful. But in this case, it is useful. All right, so if that's true, that means this is equal to that. I can put that back up in here, and I get that for my temperature derivative, I have epsilon d d beta of 1 over 1 plus e to the plus beta epsilon. And now I just have to take the derivative of that. I'm going to use the, the denominator rule, which says that that's epsilon times a minus 1 over 1 plus e to the beta epsilon squared times the derivative of what's inside, which is epsilon times e to the beta epsilon. And so I end up getting uh, epsilon squared e to the beta epsilon over 1 plus e to the beta epsilon squared. And now I'm going to repeat the trick that I did before. I'm going to multiply by e to the minus 2 beta epsilon over e to the minus 2 beta epsilon. And that's going to give me epsilon squared e to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon squared. So altogether, I get that Cv is equal to minus, I think a minus sign has gotten lost someplace here. Oh yeah, there's the minus sign. So I have a minus sign in front of here, and there's a minus sign in front of there. Minus a minus, so a plus, 
1 over kt squared epsilon squared e to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon squared. And now just to clean that up a little bit, cv is equal to k times epsilon over kt squared e to the minus beta epsilon over 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon squared. All right, so that's our final formula now. And in general, let me just comment that when we're doing these kinds of problems, there's, there's a fair amount of deriving in algebra like we just went through here. Uh, that's just part of being able to do stat mech on pretty much any system. There's actually less of it when we're dealing with atomic systems and molecular systems because there the algebra has already mostly been done for us. But when we're doing these kinds of problems where it's a new system, really, a new problem, then you've got to do some of this deriving in order to get the various expressions that you need. Okay, so we now have our expression for CV. We want to evaluate that at t equals 0. t equals epsilon over k, and t goes to infinity. At t equals 0, uh, e to the minus beta epsilon goes to 0. And if we look at what CV is, that means that's going to be 0. But t equals 0 will also cause this guy to go to infinity. So we're going to have a case where we've got infinity times 0. And does that make any sense? And the answer is yes. If we took a proper limit uh, for this case, using the rules from calculus, L'Hopital's rule and that kind of stuff, then you'd find out that it's the zero that actually wins here, and that actually cancels that infinity, even though in principle they don't have to cancel. In this case, they do. And so we get that CV is equal to zero for temperature equal to zero. Let me just comment that the reason you get the zero here when you've got this infinity times zero situation is because the, the thing that 0 is exponential and the thing that's infinity is algebraic or, or only to a power, a finite power. And exponentials always win over any finite power whenever you've got a sort of contest between the two like that. Uh, that's actually a kind of a version of L'Hopital's rule. All right. Then when when temperature goes to infinity, e to the minus beta epsilon goes to 1. Uh, and that's true in the denominator here for our expression for CV. That's true here also. That's beta epsilon, right? That epsilon over kt is beta epsilon. And so we're going to get CV is then equal to a k times a 1 times a 1 over... 1 plus 1 squared, which is just equal to k over 4. And no, I take that back. I take that back. That's totally wrong. I'm sorry. This goes to 0, right? When temperature goes to infinity, that goes to 0. So CV goes to 0. And the question is, is that reasonable? And the answer is that it's a little subtle in this case. So I didn't ask about CV going to 0 up here at t equals 0. Let's talk about that for a second. If all the population is frozen into the ground state, and now I raise the temperature just a little bit. That little bit is not enough to cause population of those upper states. And remember that the heat capacity is the amount of energy that you can store if you make a very small change in temperature. Here, when we're at t equals 0, if you make a very small change in temperature, it's not enough to cause population in the upper states and therefore not enough to store any energy, and that's why the CV is 0 
at t equals 0. The opposite kind of thing is happening down here. Now we've got a situation that t is infinite, where we've got equal populations everywhere, and now if we change the temperature a little bit, it doesn't change those populations. We've already got infinite temperature. Changing the temperature a little bit doesn't change the population. That means we also can't store any new energy. There's already some energy stored, but we can't store any new energy when we raise the temperature, and so CV is again zero. That's true, all that is true for this artificial case, but it's only true because we've got a finite number of states and the upper level is at a finite energy. That's usually not true for actual physical systems. Usually for physical systems, the energy levels just keep going all the way to infinity, and that means you never really reach a situation where you've sort of filled up all the energy levels. And that means the heat capacity doesn't go to zero as temperature goes to zero. It usually goes to some finite limit. We'll see cases like that as we go through the other uh, situations below, the other problems below. All right, so CV equals zero is actually correct for this artificial problem, but don't take that as, a, as something representative of more physically reasonable systems. All right, finally, for T equals epsilon over K, we know that E to the minus beta epsilon is equal to E to the minus 1. And so CV will be equal to K times, uh, yeah, beta epsilon is now a 1. That's actually correct in this case. E to the minus 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 1 squared. And if we plug in that algebra, I've done it over here, we get CV of point, about point 0.2. So for this case, CV is equal to point 0.1966. And that's a value that doesn't have a great deal of meaning in this case that I can see anyway. It just means that we now have some limited ability to promote states up to the upper state and therefore store energy. All right, that was the heat capacity. The last problem, or the last part of the problem, part E here, is for the entropy. And again, we're going to have to do some algebra in this case in order to get a, a useful expression for the entropy. As you probably are aware, the entropy can be calculated in a whole variety of ways, but for this particular type of problem, the best way to calculate the entropy is to take the temperature derivative of the Helmholtz free energy. So last time, to get CV, we took the temperature derivative of the internal energy. Now we're taking the temperature derivative of the Helmholtz free energy, so we're going to have a lot of the same kind of algebra to do. Remember that the Hemholtz free energy is minus kT log of Q, but that can also be written as minus 1 over beta log of Q. And remember that in this case, Q is equal to, uh, what is it? It's 2 times 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon. So it's naturally a function of beta rather than of temperature. And so once again, it's going to be algebraically simpler if we can take not a temperature derivative, but a beta derivative. And so let's play the same trick we did last time. S is equal to 1 over kT squared, the derivative of A, uh, yes, of A with respect to beta rather than with respect to temperature. And this 1 over kT squared is a minus of a minus 1 over kT squared, which is minus d beta dt. So we played the same trick this time that we played earlier with the heat capacity. All right, so now we've got to take the temperature derivative with respect to oil. We've got to take the derivative with respect to beta of A. That's d d beta of minus kT, sorry, minus 1 over beta log of Q. And that is equal to 1 over beta squared log of Q minus 1 over beta d log of Q 
d beta. But remember that the average energy is equal to minus d log of q d beta. And so this derivative of a with respect to beta is just equal to 1 over beta squared log of q plus 1 over beta times the average energy. Okay. Now all we need to do to get s is multiply that by 1 over kt squared. And now I'm going to turn, turn these betas back into kt's. So k squared t squared log q plus kt times energy, average energy. And then multiplying this k, 1 over kt squared inside gives us that s is equal to k log of q plus average energy divided by t. And so that's our final expression for energy in the most useful form for this type of problem. We know q already. We know average energy already. So this is now not so hard a problem anymore. All right, now we want to evaluate at t equals 0, t equals epsilon over k, and t goes to infinity. At t equals 0, we know that q is equal to 2 already, and we know that average energy is equal to 0. So s is just going to be equal to k log of q. Now, there is one complication. I said that the average energy is equal to zero, but if t is going to zero, then we're getting a zero over in a zero over zero sort of situation here. And so again, we'd have to take a L'Hopital rule kind of limit. Take my word for it without going into details that in this case, once again, it's the numerator here, the zero that wins in the zero over zero situation. And so this term, this second term out here, actually does go to zero when temperature goes to zero. Basically, the average energy goes to zero faster than 1 over t. All right, so we get kt log of q, but it's really k log of 2, right, because q is equal to 2 at t equals 0, and over here I've done that, I've plugged in that number, so s over k, which is what the problem actually asks for, is just log of 2, which is 0.69. At t goes to infinity, Uh, temperature is going to infinity here, epsilon, e energy is going to a finite value, it's going to epsilon over 2, remember, so that whole term is going to go to 0 again. Q is equal to 4, so S is equal to K log 4 in that case. And I've done that calculation over here as well. And log of 4, S over K is log of 4, that's 1.4 basically. All right, at T equals epsilon over K, we know that Q is equal to 2.736. We evaluated that already. And energy is equal to, what was it? It was 0.269, here it is, 0.269 times epsilon. And when you plug all those things in, uh, let's just go over here and look at what we get. Here it is down here we get that finally S over K is equal to log of Q plus the energy part, and that just ends up being 1.275. So you can see that as the temperature increases, we start from, look, we're getting some entropy at zero. I thought the rule was that if you let the temperature go to zero, then entropy has to go to zero. Isn't that the third law? It is the third law. So what's the business with us getting an entropy not equal to zero? Well, we've got some ground state degeneracy in this case, right? So this is just like the situation where there's some residual entropy at zero. For this artificial system, 
the entropy doesn't go to zero because there's a ground state degeneracy. The third law only applies when there's no ground state degeneracy. All right, so that's at t equals zero. Uh, at an intermediate value, so the t equals zero value is pretty small, 0.7. At t uh, somewhere intermediate, we get 1.275, a little bit greater entropy has gone up with temperature, that makes sense. And finally, when we go to t equals infinity, we get uh, S over k equals log 4. That's a special case. So this is basically the situation where S is equal to k log w, right? W is just the number of states in the system. When you're at infinite temperature, all those states are equally populated, and so S equals k log w works, and in this case, w is equal to 4. And it's also a little bit greater than it was when temperature was at some intermediate value down here, so all of that makes sense. All right, that's the end of problem one. Uh, we'll stop the video now, and next time I'll pick up with problem number two.